Hi, welcome back to my channel 5 Minutes Neuroimaging with Bijoy Thomas. Dr. Astik Biswas again talking to us about Glovis Pallidus Imaging Part 2. In Part 1 of the lecture, we looked at T2 hyperintense globi pallidal lesions. In this part, we look at T1 hyperintense and T2 hypointense lesions. This neonate with hyperbilirubinemia has symmetric T1 hyperintensities in the globi pallidi and the subthalamic nucleus. These findings are typical for acute connectors and the finding is due to deposition of bilirubin. Note the mild T1 hyperintensity involving the ventrolateral thalami, posterior putamina and the flocculus represents normal migration. Bilirubin deposition can also occur in the brainstem auditory nuclei and the 7th and 8th cranial nerves, therefore leading to sensory neural hearing loss. These two cases have similar pathophysiologies. Um, this child has T1 hyperintensity in the globi pallidi and the thalami. This child has susceptibility signal change in the globi pallidi, periventricular deep and subcortical white matter. Both children had hypocalcemia and hyperphosphatemia, suggesting a parrot hormone disorder. This was a case of pseudo hypoparathyroidism, whereas this was hypoparathyroidism. Both these conditions can lead to deposition of calcium in the brain and uh, symptoms such as seizures and movement disorders. T1 hyperintensity in this case was therefore due to calcium deposition. This child with dystonia had symmetric globi pallidal and subthalamic T1 hyperintensities. Um, the other striking feature was T1 hyperintensity of the anterior pituitary which is an unusual finding, uh, but is known to occur in manganese deposition. Manganese deposition can occur in hepatic failure or if the patient is on TPN. Uh, less commonly, a manganese transporter defect can be the cause of uh, manganese deposition. This child had normal liver function and was not on TPN. He was therefore tested for manganese transporter defect um, and was found to have this mutation. Um, this case therefore represents T1 hyperintensity due to manganese deposition. Uh, an important point to note is that um, the anterior pituitary can be normally T1 bright in infants. Moving on to T2 hypointense lesions, um, this case uh, you can see symmetric globi pallidal as well as thalamic T2 and flare hypointensities. Uh, the striking the most striking abnormality, however, is diffuse severe cerebral volume loss as well as a mild degree of uh, vermian volume loss. NAA peak is reduced, suggesting neuronal loss. These findings are very typical for neuronal steroid lipofuse kenosis. The ch signal changes in the globi pallidae and thalami in this case is due to deposition of autofluorescent material. Um, this is therefore a storage disorder. This child with delayed puberty um, has strikingly abnormal white matter on the T2-weighted images. Um, these are mildly hypointense on the T1-weighted images. Um, the basal ganglia, and particular the globi pallidi and ventrolateral thalami, appear dark relative to the white matter. Um, the white matter signal changes is suggestive of, a, of abnormal myelination. In this case, represents hypomyelination and the presence of hypotonsia and delayed puberty represents 4-H syndrome. Um, the abnormal appearance of the basal ganglia in this case is relative to the white matter. This boy with neuroregressive illness has um, again abnormal signal intensity in the globi pallidi with susceptibility signal change on the SWI. Um, Unusual findings in this case are a hypertrophied clava and cerebellar hyperintense cortex with mild atrophy. These findings are very specific for INAD. INAD represents, um, uh, INAD is, uh, is part of the spectrum of neurodegeneration with brain ion accumulation. Um, the new name is PLAN. Clavel hypertrophy and hyperintense cerebellar cortex are very specific for this disorder. Uh, the important point in this case is that iron deposition can also lead to 
P2 hypointense globi pallidi along with susceptibility signal change. A quick summary. The normal globus pallidus is mildly dark compared to the putamen on the T2 and mildly bright compared to the putamen on T1 weighted images. Um, these represent abnormal um, T2 and T1 weighted images. An important point, however, that I forgot to mention in part one of the lecture is that the globus pallidus can be mildly T2 hyperintense relative to the putamen up to approximately nine or 10 months of age. Um, and therefore, when you see this finding in, in this age group, it's important to do a follow-up MRI. This is a, an algorithm to, um, to help um, narrowing down, down the differential diagnosis when you see abnormal globus pallidus signal. Um, so in the case of T2 hyperintensity, if it is um, isolated to the globus pallidus, think of toxic and metabolic etiologies. Um, Toxic etiologies include chronic connectors and carbon monoxide toxicity. Metabolic etiologies include methylmalonic acidemia and creatine deficiency. If there is involvement of the globus pallidus and dentate nucleus, think of organic acidemia such as propionic acidemia, SSADH deficiency, MSUD, Canavan disease, and NF1. In the presence of globus pallidus T1 hyperintensity, think of uh, deposition of various materials such as bilirubin causing acute connectors, manganese deposition in hyperalimentation, hepatic failure, and manganese transporter defect, calcification in endocrinopathies such as abnormal parrot hormone metabolism. Um, we saw two examples of that, um, and cocaine syndrome. Cocaine syndrome tends to have calcification in other regions as well, along with um, cerebellar atrophy and progeria. Um, deposition of hemorrhagic products can also occur, um, um, and sometimes uh, it may be related to astrogliosis um, in HIE, as well as carbon monoxide poisoning. T2 hypointense globus pallidus can be secondary to storage disorders such as NCL, uh, which we saw. Other examples include GM ganglocidosis and fucosidosis. Uh, it can be due to deposition of iron in NPIA spectrum of disorders, and it can be T2 dark relative to abnormal white matter in hypomyelination syndromes. I would like to thank all my teachers and mentors uh, I've had over these years. And thank you Dr. Bijoy Thomas again for inviting me. Hope you enjoyed this video and if you like this channel, kindly subscribe and please don't forget to press the bell icon.